dear past president, dear PDGs, dear AGs, dear presidents, dear secretaries, dear friends, thank you for being so many to join us today. There is no doubt the periods we are going through are challenging, uh, that is to say, and we have to believe in Lebanon, we have to trust in it, uh, because I think those are missing elements uh, for us to have a proper ground to continue our lives in Lebanon and prepare for a better country for our next generations. I'm very happy to see uh, how, how wide our audience is tonight, uh, be it on the number of Rotarians that have joined us in this room, the variety of uh, NGO representatives that are with us, and the academics that have joined us in this webinar, which is in collaboration with the MEREF. We are all here to be all ears tonight with uh, our honorary member, Najat, who's gonna be introduced by our head of Action Le Consul along her team. All I'm gonna say is that Najat is a dear friend. She is a person of very scientific thoughts, a rational, realist, optimistic uh, doctor who's going to express to us her vision on how to structure ourselves for a better tomorrow in order to get out of this situation. Uh, I won't say any further, uh, Monsieur le Consul, the floor is yours. Thank you, President. Uh, ladies and gents, dear friends of the Rotary Club uh, Beirut Cedars, thank you once again for your presence with us. Since we have many speakers tonight with us, let's not waste too much time on the technical aspects. Uh, most of you know the drill and are frequent Zoom users. There are only two things that you need to know tonight. Um, first of all, as you can see on your screen, you can use the chat window to share ideas or express opinions with the rest of the attendees. The Q&A session will take place at the end of the lecture, but you can ask your question in the Q&A uh, window, so not in the chat window, please. If you find a question interesting, please use the little thumb and like it. This will allow the question to go up in the list and of course, the questions with the highest score will be asked first. Uh, for your information as well, a short poll will be organized during the webinar. You can reply on your screen. It is with a heavy heart, but also with, with hope and optimism that we will discover the Hadid Beirut initiative tonight, which, aimed, which aims to support Lebanese citizens in their struggle to rise again and remain rooted in their country. Najat Aoun Saliba is the co-founder of Hadid Beirut, and she will be our moderator tonight. Uh, Najat Aoun Saliba is a professor of chemistry and the director of nature of the Nature Conservation Center of the, at the American University of Beirut. She was voted among the top 100 most influential women by the BBC in 2019. She is the recipient of the 2019 L'Oréal UNESCO International Award for Women in Science, the National Order of the Cedar from the President of the Lebanese Republic, the Honorary Cedar Shield from the Speaker of the Parliament. In 2016, she received the Lebanese National Council for Scientific Research Award in the environmental category. She is also an honorary member of our club and she was awarded the Paul Harris Fellow in 2019. Dr. Aoun Saliba will interact with several other distinguished speakers tonight. Um, I will quickly present them. So first of all, um, Nuhat Yazbik Dumit is with us tonight. Uh, she is a professor of nursing and chair of the Community Health Impact Initiative at Hadid Beirut. Welcome. Joseph El Khouri is a professor of psychiatry and Chair of the Mental Health Impact Initiative at Hadid Beirut. Iman Nuwayhit is Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Envi Environmental Health Impact Initiative at Hadid Beirut. Rima Karami Akari is Professor of Education and Chair of the Education Impact Initiative at Hadid Beirut. Ustam El Aid is Entrepreneur and Co-Founder of the Backbone Initiative. Fadi Al Khatib is the board member, a board member of the FIBA Technical Committee. He is the president of Champs Club and co-executive director of Harid Beirut. And then finally, uh, Wasim Haj is a professor of computer science and chair of the interactive platform at Harid Beirut. 
Thanks to all for your presence and for your efforts in these harsh times. Dr. Najat, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Consul Parmentier, for this excellent uh, uh, opportunity for us to share. We are still waiting for a few votes. I see that only 72, 74% of the attendees have voted until now. We are waiting for the 25 remaining. Maybe we could have a comment about the, the result of the first question of the poll. Is one of the speakers, does uh, someone want, want to say something about it? Well, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yes. uh, Dr. Yazbek is going to take over. Yes. Um, so, yes, we have a good response. 95% said that it will affect us. and. Um, this is very true. It will affect us. And if we have enough time, we can explain how it will affect us. Though we have, we, we may have the money and we can afford it, but the poor health of others will definitely affect us. Thank you. We could start with the first uh, intervention of the first speaker. I think if Nuhad, you can uh, take over. Okay, I'm ready to take over. I need you to scroll down to what it says, Nuhad. Okay, thank you. So it's like common knowledge that the healthcare sector in Lebanon is managed by political parties or at least is influenced or is affected or is affiliated with political parties. In addition to being overpowered by clientelism, it made the healthcare services fragmented and lack the system approach to make sure that the healthcare services are achieving their targets and outcomes. That really uh, made the healthcare uh, in Lebanon very weak. With the three crises, the financial crisis, COVID-19, and recently the blast, it uh, crippled the healthcare in the country. And uh, we have evidence to, to this uh, conclusion and it is documented. So based on that and because uh, the, the recent blast really exposed the weakness of the healthcare services in Lebanon, um, uh, many initiatives and today I read in the newspaper that there were, there were 385 uh, uh, non-governmental, whether local or international organizations wor working on the grounds of the blasted area. Uh, so to really uh, fulfill the, the uh, mission of healthcare services and act on behalf of the Ministry of Health. So what we did in Khadid Beirut is we did a field assessment. We went to the uh, uh, communities where uh, the, mainly the Marmkhail area and the Karantina area. Uh, it, the people who did this uh, field assessment, in addition to myself, is Dr. Joseph Kuri and Dr. Gladys Hnein. And we collected other information from uh, colleagues working on the grounds who responded uh, through an emergency response teams to the uh, uh, blast. What we observed is uh, to start with, when you go do windshield uh, assessment, you look at the environmental hazards all around us, and uh, Dr. Nwahid is gonna address that. But uh, what I want to point out is that even the healthcare providers who should be aware of the uh, hazards um, uh, were not really taking care of themselves in order to uh, avoid that. Uh, what we observed are uh, people with chronic illnesses carrying bags full of uh, empty cartoon boxes of medications uh, coming to uh, take, uh, take uh, uh, filled boxes. And our conclusion was this is a poorly managed patient. At least in three locations, we have observed more than 50% of such uh, cases. And this has very drastic implications on the health of the Lebanese, uh, let alone on the economic expenditure uh, for uh, health services. Uh, 
but also we observe that people are saying openly that they need mental health assistance and this is something for us uh, a new phenomena where people used to shy off doing uh, talking about mental health and needing psychiatric help now people are saying it and are expressing it and the expressed needs are the most honest uh, uh, the third observation is that uh, though uh, there are services, whether uh, urgent, emergent, or uh, part of the primary health care services, where they do provide for chronic illnesses, care for chronic illnesses, reproductive health, and health of the child, uh, but uh, the, uh, there are two areas that are missed, the care of the elderly and the care of the disabled who are homebound. Uh, the other observations were when uh, all these uh, organizations are helping people and bringing food and everything, uh, we noticed that the, the boxes uh, that have some food items on them contained unhealthy uh, uh, salt, uh, salt and uh, salt, salty food and uh, fatty food that are uh, not supposed to be included in in a, in a box like that. Some people voiced their uh, uh, no trust in the healthcare system, thus trusting the uh, international NGOs rather than uh, the local uh, services. Uh, can we move to the next, next slide, please? So what we are proposing in Khadit Beirut, uh, the health of the community, and uh, it is an integrated uh, uh, kind of service, it is a community-driven healthcare services. And community-driven means that based on the expressed needs of the people living in the quarantine area where we saw most of the healthcare needs, and because there is a primary healthcare center that is uh, completely de demolished and it is not politically affiliated, it is only under the Ministry of Health. Um, so we thought that we want to create a community-driven healthcare services in that area and specifically that area because um, to my surprise, but not to others' surprise, in that area there are two streets, the Muslim and the Christian, and they don't deal with each other, they don't take services uh, if I'm living in this street, I don't go the, to the other street to take services, etc. Even within the Muslim street, uh, there are two sub-streets, that of the Lebanese and that of the non-Lebanese. Uh, so it leads to fragmented uh, efforts and initiatives, and it exhausts anybody who wants to provide care. This is why there were, uh, for instance, in Carantina, uh, Carantina area, um, uh, 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 what, what's it called? Uh, area one and area two and area one is for that religious whatever group and area two for the other and the, the NGOs have to define had to divide if efforts uh, between the two streets. So we strive uh, that through the community driven healthcare services we uh, we will be able to provide comprehensive healthcare packages and this will be in uh, coordination and in agreement with the um, uh, primary health care department of the Ministry of Public Health for uh, follow-up, sustainability, uh, maintenance, etc. So the comprehensive health care package should, uh, would include not only the usual ones which are chronic illness management, reproductive health, child health, but also activate the mental health uh, services and pay attention to older adults and disabled people, specifically who are homebound and need home care. But also it will be, uh, uh, be interprofessionally led using an interprofessional practice model that evidence shows its uh, effect on expanded access to care, efficient use of resources, continuity of care, and improved chronic care management. But also it is community uh, driven because it will be community, there will be community collaboration and partnership where the, the services will uh, involve engagement of the community 
in uh, getting feedback from them, uh, getting to know what their needs are, using them, but then engaging them in providing some uh, services. Uh, there, sh there will be community health activity designed and implemented by the people in the, in, in the community. And it may create job opportunities for residents in the community, especially the youth uh, who we can uh, train them in certain healthcare services uh, where they may benefit uh, for their uh, livelihood. Uh, we hope that we, we are in the uh, stage where we are writing a proposal uh, and we hope that this kind of uh, uh, a program uh, will, uh, especially the community collaboration and partnership arm, uh, is, will lead to peace. So it's like uh, health is a path to peace. And I'm ready to take questions. Jean-Marc, can you please put the poll of the, uh, the results of the poll, please? Uh, for Dr. Dume to comment on. Okay, so even if I can afford healthcare and I have access to healthcare, but having people around me who are sick, it will affect me. It will affect my business because if I have business and my staff are sick, it will cost me more, they will be less productive, it will affect the whole business. If I'm uh, at a school and the, the students are sick, it will affect uh, the whole uh, uh, outcomes of the, the education system. If there are very sick people in the communities, uh, they cannot be pro productive, they will be a burden on the healthcare sector and the healthcare sector will not be able to provide uh, services for me as, as much as I wish. So it is a vicious cycle where one, uh, uh, one event leads to the other. What we need uh, for, uh, for the businesses, for the livelihoods, for the education, for uh, whether schools or universities, uh, uh, we need healthy people who are productive, who are uh, able to uh, contribute to, to the economy of the country. So they all uh, affect each other. And this is in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dumit. Uh, I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Khouri. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Najat, and uh, thank you for the organizers. I'm going to probably give the, the quickest uh, overview of mental health uh, in Lebanon I've ever given in my life, but I, hopefully I'll be able to uh, uh, sum up the most important points that you know, will, will help us understand what is needed. Just to say that uh, the last time there was a nationwide study on Lebanon, uh, probably the data is from about 13 to 14 years ago, which was a very different time. Since then, we have some small studies, we have anecdotal evidence, we have media reports. When somebody commits suicide, we get excited for about two days and then we forget. Uh, but at least we can say that the problem of mental health in Lebanon is at least as bad as in any other country and possibly worse uh, with especially these particular uh, uh, disorders that I'm showing here, anxiety, depression, uh, drugs and alcohol consumption, and also the chronic, chronic severe disorders that are less talked about, like schizophrenia, uh, autism, Asperger's, uh, Alzheimer as well. All these constitute the umbrella of mental health. But also mental health is not something that always happens in clinic. Mental health is also uh, the, the mental state, the mental of well-being that will make you rebuild your shop after it was destroyed after the, the 4th of August. It's also the one that will, uh, the level of anxiety will make you emigrate from Lebanon or stay in Lebanon if you're assured. So mental health is, is, is really affecting everybody. And obviously some people more need a more advanced intervention, but anything the state does or anything we do, anything NGOs do, can also contribute to the mental well-being of the population. So the feeling of being abandoned or the feeling of being uh, looked after. And we saw what happened when uh, the French president arrived and how much people were putting hope on it. That also is mental health. So just to give you a brief uh, uh, overview of what mental health in Lebanon constitutes, uh, we are around 75 active psychiatrists in this country. If we go, need to go by the standards, we need at least 400. 
And that's 400 psychiatrists with an entire network of nurses, psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists that are almost inexistent, almost inexistent. And uh, we have troubles training psychiatric nurses. We don't have the proper uh, um, sort of uh, the proper networks to do that. Psychology training is very uh, patchy, except in very, very few uh, programs and extremely expensive. So for you to be able to see a psychologist, and there are lots of psychologists in this country, but for you to be able to see a well-trained, well-equipped, well-supervised psychologist, you're going to struggle. And probably now with what's happening, many will emigrate as well, or it's going to become very unaffordable. Just to give you an idea of uh, how much it costs to see a, a very good psychologist in this country at this stage, it's at least between 300,000 liras to 400,000 liras per session. So that's probably unaffordable for many people. Insurance companies, and I have a major problem with this because despite us being advanced on many other things in Lebanon, insurance, private insurance coverage for psychiatric and psychological care is almost inexistent. And this is one of the few times where the state is better than the private sector. And no matter how many times you try to sit with companies, with very um, uh, educated people, there seems to be a wall that you know, we can't cross for some reason. Uh, Foreign companies uh, do cover, and that's when we, fight, we, are, we as a psychiatrist feel very equipped that we can help somebody because he has BUPA or AXA or whatever, and uh, it's really shameful. Uh, the Ministry of Public Health has very little resources. They don't actually have a mental health budget. What they do is that they use foreign NGOs, like Médecins Sans Frontières, like Médecins du Monde, like others, and these came originally for the refugees. They did not come for the Lebanese, but they started actually looking after the Lebanese and we kind of benefited as a host nation, but that's not sustainable. We obviously have the National Mental Health Program, which is attached to the Ministry of Health and has done a lot over the years, including putting a mental health hotline and uh, trying to support hospitals in the, in the public sector. We have the Lebanese Psychiatric Society, which is the representative of the psychiatrist and I'm, I'm the president elect. We have the Lebanese Psychological Association which has tried to be involved in regulating uh, the, 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 the psychology uh, profession. We have university hospitals, but they cannot really provide for beyond uh, a very small proportion of the population and they're expensive. What happened with COVID-19 is that many of the psychiatric beds or psychiatric units were shut down and converted into COVID units, or simply we did not have enough uh, staff to fill them up. And that's around I would say 70, 80% of the beds were no longer available. And again, no one in the media talked about it. With the economic crisis, healthcare has become really unaffordable for many people and the salaries in Lebanese are not following. But unfortunately, the therapists and the psychiatrists simply cannot afford uh, providing the, uh, the, uh, the therapy. And medication shortage is the new kid on the block, it's the new problem. Many medications are no longer affordable and the companies no longer import them. So even if they're cheap, no one wants to bring them. Beirut explosion, again, top of all this, trauma cases, new trauma cases. People who have never seen a psychiatrist now are seeing a psychiatrist. Kids are not sleeping. And these are, this is the new epidemic that unfortunately, again, we're very poorly equipped to deal with and very poorly trained to deal with. So what have we decided to do? Uh, if I can just have the next slide, please. Yes, so very, again, in, in a nutshell, we need to identify the needs in the affected area. We decided to focus on the affected area because it's an opportunity, as Dr. Nuhat said, people are asking for help, and that's the best time to tell them what kind of help they need because people don't always know what they need. They know what the problem is, but they don't necessarily know what the solution is. And there's a lot of misinformation in the media and a lot of people who tell you they can help, but really when you look at the resources, they're not there. We need to identify what's available. We need to bring it together because people don't talk to each other. Ministries don't talk to each other. You might find that the Ministry of Public Health does not talk to the Ministry of Social Affairs. And I know this for a fact because sometimes I got them to meet together and they, on, on issues like a drug use or, or uh, mental health. We need to identify funders and donors who are interested in sustainable mental health, not just you know, the response for the next few weeks, because most likely this is covered now by these international NGOs. But if we need to build a system in these places where people get help with medication, with psychology, with psychosocial support, we need to think long-term and that requires amount of money. We need to work closely with all the stakeholders and I believe in the primary care centers being 
at the core of these uh, communities. We need to make them the place where people go for mental health care and only will go to specialists when there is need for it. Because a lot of the time people go see a specialist and most things can be resolved at the level of the primary care center with nursing, with uh, good support, even with just the, your regular doctor talking to you in a humane way. We need to then use this to have a nationwide capacity building. And already we're starting to train psychologists in the hundreds uh, for properly addressing trauma issues so that even if the next crisis happens, and we know it in Lebanon, it's gonna happen, that these people then we don't need, don't need training. And we need to raise awareness about what is mental health, that it's not something that happened in some obscure clinic somewhere that you need to be, go see this, you know, a uh, psychiatrist who's going to prescribe tons of medication. Actually, mental health is everybody's business. And if the mental health of my neighbor is better, I'm going to sleep better. If I'm not going to end up in a fight with the valet parking, I'm going to feel better and everybody's going to feel better about it. That is, for me, what is mental health. And I hope that Khadr Beirut, through everything that's been, done, been happening, will be able to improve the mental health of the nation. So that's from me at this stage. And thank you for the opportunity to mention all these points. Thank you, Dr. Khouri. This is amazing. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Nwayhid to uh, uh, present uh, the Environmental Health Impact Initiative, please. Please, can you show me the earlier slide? The background slide. Oh, it's not showing. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, Behind, behind, so uh, uh, first, thank you, Najat, and thanks for the organizers. So behind that box, there's an image that doesn't show. And, um, and this, is, uh, this is the explosion. No, before that, yeah, it's, uh, the animation is not working. So, um, so the image of the explosion itself, and then uh, we see also the, so please just take, take a second to, Reimagine, and I apologize for that. Just to 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 reconnect to the images that we've all um, lived through over the last few weeks. So we've seen that uh, that uh, uh, mushroom and that uh, that uh, cloud. We've seen destroyed um, uh, uh, buildings. We've seen destroyed cars. We've seen uh, uh, survivors and and people who are hurting. We've seen uh, uh, people who are working. Um, and trying to to help and um, and and engage in the relief efforts. So, uh, looking at all of this, um, the kind of questions we have to ask when we think about the environmental health impact are the following: one, what's in there? So, what's in the fumes? What's in the rubble? What's in the air? What's in the water network? And so, these are the kind of questions. What's what's in the sea? And so these are the kind of questions we have to ask. And, and there we're thinking about the potential environmental hazards. And for that, we'll actually engage in, in environmental sampling. So as soon, within days actually of the blast, um, the team, a team actually um, started taking samples from the rubbles, um, air samples, uh, collecting them, storing them. And, and, and now as we speak, there's an ongoing uh, um, environmental sampling uh, strategy. Uh, we do know that other groups are also uh, taking samples and we're trying to connect and make sure that we coordinate and share some of that data. So the first question is what's in there? What kind of hazards people could have been exposed to? The second question is who is exposed? Who's there in those images? And, and we've, seen, we've seen the people, we've seen the survivors uh, that were bleeding and stunned. And, but those people, when we're looking at their wounds, at the same time, they were exposed to some kind of an environmental hazard. So we need to think of them as a group that has been exposed and maybe acutely uh, to some of those uh, hazards. We need to think of the professional workers. This is the, uh, the army, the, uh, the Red Cross, the civil defense, uh, the uh, um, and, uh, the re relief workers, paid relief workers. So those are the professional workers. And, and then we have to think also of the volunteers. And we've seen that hundreds and thousands actually of, uh, of youth uh, went to the street and started cleaning up. And by doing that, they were exposed to, to dust, to fibers, to, 
to again an unknown uh, set of um, uh, of hazards and of course the 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 group that is there are the families themselves, the, the residents of, um, of those areas that have been impacted. Some of those maybe who could afford it have left and they took a break or, or stayed away from, for, from their houses because they were inhabitable or because they, uh, they, uh, they just want to stay with family. But, uh, but some other uh, uh, groups and families were stuck, were stuck in the debris and in the rubble, were stuck in the with the, within the uh, whatever exposures they are there. So as you see, the, the, you have the hazards and you have people that are exposed. And then we ask the question of time, because some people could have been exposed for short duration, other could have been exposed for a longer duration. The hazards themselves do change with time. And so that's why we're continuing environmental sampling over weeks uh, to make sure whether, whether these, uh, some of these hazards have changed over time. And, uh, and then, and then we, we need to think of time of the acute effect of these exposures and the long-term effects of these exposures. For example, uh, we're all worried about asbestos, especially in the old buildings. And, and asbestos is a carcinogenic, but you could be exposed now and you get the cancer, which is a mesothelioma. This is a cancer of the cover of the lungs and that it could happen in 20, 30 or 40 years. So, uh, so time also is a factor that we need to think about we need to know what people were exposed to. We need to know who was exposed and, and anticipate or monitor or try to understand if we see any uh, health cases and any things that we need to explain. And then the, the question that uh, with all of this, we put them together and we need to think of, um, of location, the distance from the site of exposure. Najat, uh, following slide, please. Najat. Yes, thanks. So, so here you see the, the um, sort of a heat map and, and, um, and uh, the, the, at the center of the uh, middle circle there to the right, uh, this is the site of the explosion, what we refer to as ground zero. As you move away, one would expect that the damages are less. And so you see the red, and then as you move away, red, and you see some green and yellow, and then as you move further from the site of explosion, the ground zero, the hazards could change. So as we think of these questions, what hazards, who was exposed uh, and for how long and what time? And, and then the other thing is in what location, because those, those will change um, uh, with locations. So the, uh, the other, uh, 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 the next slide please. So you see here, we've transformed this into a schematic diagram that serves as a framework for our thinking. So you see to the left, you have the ground zero and zone A is within one kilometer, zone B is within one to two kilometers, zone C is beyond two kilometers. This is the distance factor. And so we expect that it is worse and more environmental hazards at, as we come closer to the ground zero. Then what kind of environmental hazards? Of course, we think of safety and that this is, uh, this is existent in all the zones. Structural uh, hazards, they are more closer to the, to the site of explosion because some of this, uh, you have structural damages there and then you have structural uh, hazards. Thus, fibers and fumes, this is uh, more within ground zero, zone A and zone B, less so as you move to the other zones the water quality, we need to think whether the North water network has been affected and whether it has been polluted, whether it's still safe uh, uh, to, to drink or, or utilize. And then we have to think of also biological hazards because in some, in some of these old houses, you could have mold, uh, fungi, and so you could have afan. So the mold could be, could be hidden in corners of these houses with the humidity and in confined places. Um, again, there could be exposures to, uh, to this kind of microorganisms. The exposed population, I spoke about, about the different groups, and, and then you see them actually, uh, you have different groups in different areas. So as you move to zone C, it's mostly the residents. You move closer, you have volunteers. You move even closer, you have the professional workers and, uh, and others. Uh, next, please. 
So we, I spoke about these are some of the actions that we need to think about, we need to engage and we need to collaborate with others on. We spoke about the sample learning and analysis, surveying people. I was talking about the exposed population. We need to know who and is exposed and we're working with World Health Organization and others to try to actually identify those populations. Then we have to think of preventive measures, making people aware of, of these hazards and, and recommend certain uh, preventive measures. They could be structural engineering ones and they could be personal equipment and, uh, and some protective uh, measures. So we've started to, so far I, I have been talking about what's in there and what the problem is, how we're trying to do that. This is part of the answer. Next slide please, Najat. And, and so what we're trying to do is to work with the local stakeholders. We're not the only people who are looking at the environment. There could be other groups. We know that some international agencies and international groups are doing that. And so we need to uh, make sure that we get to know what uh, each group is doing so that we don't duplicate the resources are limited. Uh, we, we don't have the resources to analyze samples here. We need to coordinate. So the Khadit Beirut, part of its actually goals is to serve as that platform of, uh, of coordination. And so this is a meeting that we held uh, two days ago at the headquarters of the World Health Organization here in Beirut. And so this was an exercise where the participants were asked to think of what is most probable and what are the severity of the hazards and so. Uh, next, please. And, and uh, this is uh, a set of safety recommendations that we've developed jointly with the World Health Organization. And again, we got feedback from international experts and we've used international literature. So this is a way of collecting information, trying to share uh, some of those recommendations. And we do realize that not everybody can read English. So we have to translate to Arabic and transform them into easier messages and uh, join them with uh, some training, even if it is short to the point training sessions so that people know what they're exposed to. I think this is, uh, this is uh, my part. Thanks, Najat. Thank you, Dr. Nwahid. I'm sharing the results uh, of the poll uh, of the second question. Were you engaged in the relief efforts in the first week after the Beirut blast? If you like, yeah. if you would yeah, like yeah. to come. It, so, so this is this is uh, I don't know how many participants, maybe hundred, maybe more, in uh, uh, at this uh, uh, webinar. So close to fifty percent, forty-five percent have have just informed us that they've been engaged in the relief efforts. This is exactly what's driving this uh, uh, this kind of questions of who was exposed, and and uh, some of those people. Uh, if we really want to know more, you have to add much, more, many more questions. So, but the question here is just telling us that yes, there is a problem. Many people were engaged. Um, uh, this is not a problem. The, the engagement is actually a beautiful thing and we're all encouraging it. But the question is, how do we make sure uh, to inform them and they have to know what they've been exposed to just for information and we need to protect uh, people as we move forward. So this tells us, confirms uh, that our, our, our gut feeling, and, and we've now known it from visits to the, to the ground, that uh, many people have been engaged and could have been exposed to different hazards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nwahid. Sorry for the technical problem. I wasn't the one who was moving the slides because my computer froze, but if you could allow me to uh, to uh, share my screen because I know Dr. Rima Akkari is keen on having the, uh, the animation. So if you could allow me to share the screen, uh, I will try again. And if I get stuck, uh, uh, then you can go back and... Well, there is uh, on the chat, uh, uh, Mr. Walid is asking, uh, can we get the recommendations sent to us, please? I don't know how we can do that, but uh, definitely those recommendations are. Uh, if you visit, if you visit the, the website of Khadit uh, Beirut, you're going to find them posted there. 
Thank you, Dr. Nuaihid, Dr. Akkari, Dr. Karami Aki. Please, I will try to see if the animation is going to work. And I apologize. Okay. No problem. No All problem. Right. Thank you, Najat, and uh, thank you, everybody attending and for the hosts. Uh, so I'll also try to be uh, fast to speak about uh, this uh, impact initiative uh, uh, under Khadit Beirut. Uh, so in the education sector, this uh, the Beirut blast uh, for you know was just uh, another crisis on top of many crises. Uh, chronic history of uh, dealing with this sector as under a lot of problems. Uh, so we I see it more as uh, a tip of the iceberg, despite all the destruction that it has caused in a huge area. However, the real problems are quite hidden and very chronic. This is a sector that has uh, suffered from uh, government uh, neglect, had uh, been uh, totally thrown on the shoulders of uh, private institutions. More than 70% of the kids in Lebanon are educated in private schools. Uh, we have a sector where teachers are not uh, really uh, compensated or have any job security. And it was really reflected in acute inequities. So lots of success stories, but major, major marginalization of big portion of the uh, students and the poor quality of the services uh, that, that they have been uh, receiving. One of the um, uh, hallmarks of this sector is that there were a lot, a long history of attempts and at providing relief. So, however, uh, a lot of those attempts were uh, very un uh, uncoordinated and hence we are still in the same place uh, despite a lot of uh, people involved, effort, money, funds, uh, we are going nowhere. And uh, so if I can have the next slide, uh, please. So what we're trying to do in uh, Khadit Beirut is uh, that we're is that we, we really want to shift the paradigm on how uh, we are trying to resolve the problems of uh, the sector. Uh, and, and the shift is to go from those scattered relief efforts that had, we, we have plenty of evidence to show us that they had, uh, were inefficient, uh, they focused on limited fixes, short-lived impact, uh, to uh, really shift toward uh, coordinated construction efforts. Trigger those coordinated construction efforts as well as identify those on the ground and try to bring them together. We want to do that with, with uh, uh, a, a backdrop of having a vision, uh, being innovative and sustainable. This is a sector that is broken, uh, so we don't want to fix what is there. We want really to construct uh, a new reality and again, you know, the Beirut blast had us in this place where we are uh, saying uh, this is the time. Uh, everybody knows we are uh, in major uh, problems here. So uh, I can see, I don't know if you hear me. Uh, this is why we, we need to, uh, to go to a totally new paradigm in doing that. So our approach uh, is centered on, on a vision. Uh, and this vision is about the school being at the center of what we provide. And we see the school as the center with partners and we call those vital partners. And the vital partners are actually the parents, uh, the uh, educational experts that are working very closely with the school uh, to understand their need and the local community partners also that have uh, deep knowledge of the school and uh, work with them. Uh, so basically, this, why are we calling this a, also a paradigm a shift? Because uh, we often treated in our uh, relief effort, the school as if it is an island. We, everybody rushed to the help. Everybody assumed or operated as we know how can, we can help and we can lend a hand. And we really neglected to hear uh, the voices of the expert at the school level, the one that are the closest uh, to the children who understand the nature of uh, their needs and the context of where they are living. So we see this little circle in the middle as uh, a, a tight-knit collaboration. Where we, we see that the tight-knit partnership that uh, in Khadda, the approach we are uh, going is to strengthen this partnership and then encourage them to identify their own needs 
help them to articulate those needs and come up themselves with the proposals where they ask for help and with the initiatives that requires the help of the larger group. And what we're also doing, uh, doing is that we are mapping who are these, uh, the, the larger groups that usually uh, help uh, schools and uh, trying to, uh, from one hand, coordinate with them, but also communicate to them uh, some quality guidelines from the experience, accumulated experiences, the lesson learned throughout the years about what worked, what didn't work. We have quite a bit of that and uh, design the strategy or put guidelines for the strategies that can guide the proposals or the initiative that can be developed. So as, as a, an action uh, strategy, can we go back one second to the previous slide, please, Najar? So as an action strategy that we, we are uh, following, we are uh, going, we are developing those quality guidelines, uh, determining some domains uh, that we, a uh, big umbrella for what are the needs of the school, we are uh, inviting proposals uh, that are, uh, again, built on the community, on the school community identified needs. We want to invite those proposals for initiatives from experts, and this can include educational experts or NGOs. And then we, we can uh, come and try to connect funding to them. And the funding, we thought of it as could be small scale or large scale, but all within uh, this uh, vision of supporting the school as the center uh, target of our effort and our uh, 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 construction effort. Uh, so the domains that we have identified, these were based on, again, uh, the uh, history of what has been weak uh, within the sector, as well as what got aggravated because of the uh, COVID-19. And of course, now with the blast, many schools lost their buildings and many schools are, uh, you know, like not just because of COVID-19 are going to uh, this remote learning or alternative ways of learning. And, and those are the domains that we will be inviting and encouraging initiative to tell us what is the best way uh, to adjust the curriculum content, to work on the students' well-being, uh, to build and strengthen the school community partnership. Uh, we also want to uh, look at making sure that those teachers are supportive, are, are pre uh, prepared, and also are using alternative pedagogical tools that are more uh, conducive to the vision for the students that, uh, that we want. Uh, we, we also pay attention to the organization and capacity. So what we did uh, so far based on these large uh, domains and also the conversation that we've been having with our partners uh, that uh, we are coordinating with is that we identify kind of uh, potential funding uh, domains, we call them, that no matter what is the format of the initiative, this would be uh, essential and integral to those uh, initiatives. We, we are going to need support for the teachers, whether because they are putting extra effort or because they, the schools are losing them. Uh, because of the financial crisis. We need major support with school supplies and educational uh, material, uh, the, the experts that can work on the uh, with the students and uh, on improving their well-being, uh, tutors, uh, because many homes cannot really uh, give any of the guidance that is now uh, needed at the, at the home front to do the alternative approaches to uh, teaching and learning. Uh, and, you know, the expert trainers uh, that you know, we're trying now to get, we have some volunteers, but this for sustainability is going to need uh, some funding. We also thought that you know, uh, funders can uh, really have a holistic approach where they would say, I will adopt one school, few schools, and, and see uh, how can I cover many domains of their needs, or we can uh, take certain limited initiatives or programs, or uh, maybe uh, adopt a family, a student, and provide those needs. So we're trying to think of those domains in a flexible manner, uh, in a manner that uh, will, uh, you know, uh, capitalize on uh, working within the framework, but at the same time, uh, capturing all the kind of resources that we can obtain. And thank you. Thank you so much. We're gonna sh try to rush a little bit because we're short in uh, on time. Please, Hossam, can you go ahead? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Najat, uh, and thank you, uh, Rotary Club Beirut Cedars. 
uh, for uh, organizing this session. Uh, I'm gonna uh, a little bit uh, before explain that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, us as SMEs, uh, we were always uh, having the desire to live uh, and uh, to live stronger, uh, opposing a culture of uh, darkness, of death, and of going backward. Uh, anything uh, devilish uh, uh, anyone can imagine uh, happened on the 4th of uh, August at 6 or 8 p.m. Uh, uh, this this uh, following years where we were trying to survive, to keep the smile, and to show resilience. Uh, on the fifth, when we went back to our shops in daylight, uh, Akid there was shock. And as Dr. Khoury explained it uh, 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 and described it, there was uh, anxiety, uh, anger, uh, depression. Uh, we didn't know what, uh, what, uh, what to do, uh, looking at, uh, at uh, this, this structure uh, around us uh, about the, the, uh, uh, everything, uh, you know, uh, uh, blood everywhere. So, uh, but we realized at this point that we cannot uh, surrender. Uh, we cannot surrender for our people, uh, their families, uh, uh, and uh, definitely for us as uh, business people, where we invested millions of dollars in places we call uh, home and we will keep on calling home. A uh, couple phones among us, uh, the, 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 the SMEs there, and, uh, we, and Backbone was created. Uh, we are one community in this area, from the shops to the people living, uh, uh, to everybody, to the, to the companies around us. Uh, I am nine years old in Jemaisi. Uh, it's something for me. It's my second, uh, it's my second home. Uh, so, uh, and uh, 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 talking to many people, we met the wonderful uh, uh, people of Khadid Beirut, and, uh, and together we created uh, 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 with, between Backbone and Khadid Beirut, uh, uh, hope uh, uh, is, uh, is brought back that we can really uh, transform uh, the, uh, the reality that we were looking at. Uh, so uh, uh, our, our work is divided into uh, two phases. Definitely the mission is uh, to bring back those places to life because uh, when you walk down in Jermaisi and, uh, and Marim Khayil, uh, you feel, uh, you feel uh, these, uh, these are ghost towns, uh, uh, so uh, we have to come back, because if we don't come back, life won't uh, come back to the area. So uh, we divided our work into two phases. Uh, phase one uh, uh, is to, uh, through donors, is to rebuild the venues, to save the businesses, and definitely to uh, keep the employees working. Uh, uh, and phase two, uh, while, uh, while brainstorming, uh, uh, we thought that why not to push further uh, our work between uh, Khadid Beirut and Backbone and really uh, create uh, a vision uh, for uh, these SMEs for the coming five years uh, to propose laws and regulations uh, uh, and, uh, to, uh, through, uh, and through the experts to provide uh, development. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we don't want to come back to... Uh, to the force, uh, to, to what were, to the situation we were in before the fourth of August, we were in uh, in, in very bad shape. So uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, stage one is to uh, uh, to rebuild these shops and uh, and everyone uh, and everyone we're talking to uh, uh, and everyone who submitted their information uh, uh, to Backbone, uh, they wanna come back. They wanna uh, they wanna reopen. Uh, their shops or the street SMEs at, uh, as, uh, as we call them. Uh, please, Najat, can you move to the uh, second? Uh... Okay, so how, uh, how are we working together with Khadid Beirut? First, we are uh, collecting the data through a form we have, uh, a Google form we have, that, uh, that's asking everyone about uh, uh, how many employees they have, uh, uh, what's the current situation, what, what are the damages, uh, uh, what's the, uh, uh, when they expect, uh, when they want to open and when they expect to open uh, due to the damages and the works uh, uh, needed. Uh, and uh, definitely what's the, what's the budget that they, uh, they require to uh, reopen their shops. Uh, uh, once the data is collected, we're gonna assess uh, this data uh, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, everything is correctly mentioned. Uh, uh, we are getting the correct uh, uh, offers uh, from the different contractors uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 
making sure uh, uh, how how we're going to work. Definitely, there are criteria related to how to prioritize uh, these shops in relation to how many people uh, they will come back to work. And definitely, uh, uh, point two, uh, uh, if the running cost uh, is uh, is not hard on uh, those institutions, because uh, you know, in in our business or in, in the SME's business, there is the capex or everything that we build, and there is the operation expenses. Usually the operation expenses uh, are much more than the, than the fixed uh, capex that is uh, 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 put uh, in, these, uh, in these institutions. Uh, and uh, the third part is uh, to provide uh, the donations, to get the donations from either the Lebanese uh, diaspora outside, uh, companies here, people in Lebanon, uh, 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 institutions, uh, uh, so uh, so we're gonna get the, uh, these donations and we're gonna uh, implement the works uh, through a, a certain process that uh, we have together with Khadda, with Khadda Beirut and finally make the audit that everything was done and that uh, we are moving forward. So this is briefly uh, what uh, Khadda and Backbone are gonna do. Uh, uh, we are starting hopefully next week to uh, uh, to uh, start works on the first uh, uh, on the first shop to rebuild them and uh, and moving forward uh, uh, and bringing life really to uh, all the shops in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Hussam. I'm just going to share the results with the audience to see the the answers to the question. Assuming the shops in the affected areas are ready to open next week. Are you ready to visit the cafes, restaurants, and pubs? And we have the results of 37% normally, they will go back. 40% they said less frequently, and 23% said no, not yet. We need, would, them. Uh, we need them to come back because we need to come back to life. Uh, so I'm gonna move quickly to Dr. Hajj, if you can, uh, sorry. Uh, if you if you can introduce the platform, uh, and then uh, and then we uh, because we're running really out of time. So thank you, Hossam. Dr. Al Hajj, can you please present the platform quickly, uh, so that we go back to to what I missed in the in the beginning about what is Khadid Beirut. Uh, just one slide to conclude with that. Dr. Al Hajj, please. Sure. Thank you, Najat, and uh, thank you for the uh, Rotary Club for allowing us to, uh, giving us this opportunity. So uh, uh, myself and my team are taking care of the interactive platform. We started initially with a, a Google site that is uh, very uh, primitive, but allowed us to uh, go live uh, fairly, very quickly. Uh, we made sure that uh, by this meeting today, we have the new website up and running. So it is khaddedbeirut.com. It is now in a, uh, in a new, a new design and more functionality. Uh, we are also, uh, we're using uh, like recent technologies for uh, the web design and for the mapping as well. So one of the major things that we will do is to do the analytics and the mapping. So we will uh, uh, get the data from Hossam, for example, SMEs, we will get the data from the health group, from the psychiatry group, from the education group, and so on. And we will work with them closely in order to provide the best way for presenting and making this information tell a certain story to get a certain objective. Uh, if you can proceed, Najat, to the second slide. And uh, this is like a simple example of some of the uh, statistics taken out from the recent survey that was done for the SMEs. And uh, they show like uh, some of the interesting results that you cannot see if you don't visualize the data. Uh, for example, bars and restaurants are the most effective, which is uh, clear. I was uh, mostly uh, interested in the period to reopen. And you will see that the vast majority of the restaurants out there, they, they want to reopen. They want to come back to life. Uh, you can see the number of, of employees that, uh, which is really big, around 1,500 employees uh, that are currently out of work because of the destruction that happened. And also in the estimated damage, you can see that uh, if like the amounts to rebuild these SMEs are not really much. So like around 30 of them can go back to work with less than $10,000. 
or the vast majority with around 20 to 50,000, they can go back to work. So uh, we, we will uh, hopefully keep uh, producing such uh, infogra infographics on the website. Uh, that will be interactive uh, when uh, geolocation is available and interesting and tells a story. We will also uh, post it as well on the website. And uh, I finish by saying that uh, feel free to visit the website, check it out uh, for more information, and you can contact us through the website as well. Thank you. Uh, I would like, if the time allows, uh, to go back to introduce Khadid Beirut because uh, uh, I was cut off the first time. Uh, like, you sh like you saw, Khadid Beirut is a platform to actually answer the community and create a sound uh, procedure by which we would like to intervene with the community. And this is extremely important. So that's why uh, our interventions go around four impact initiatives, the community health, environmental health, education, and business community. We also have some vitalizing initiatives that have to do with mobilizing the community and the diaspora to support Khadid Beirut. We have already Khadid Beirut hubs in many places around the world. Uh, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, colleagues uh, who are helping us in managing the whole thing and putting a very uh, sound structure around Khadid Beirut. We have also colleagues who are specialized in documenting the process and the outcomes who are helping us, helping us from around the world. And we are teaming up with several laboratories, global agencies and universities to uh, understand how we Lebanese people are, despite all odds, trying to create a system by which we can uh, save our sanity and save our city. I wanna thank you so much for uh, the attention and for the attendance, and would like to turn it to Consul Parmentier. Actually, before leaving the floor to the president for the concluding remarks, I just want to, to read maybe two sentences, which are a good, a good summary. Um, indeed, the mission of Khalid Beirut is to identify losses, draw guidelines, fund, channel relief to credible institutions already active in this field of work and audit project implementation. The roadmap to recovery is not about rebuilding the city, but rebuilding faith in a time of great pain, frustration, and chaos. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to our president for the concluding remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Najat, Iman, Ohad, Sam, Wasim, Iman, and Joseph for your different uh, presentations. Very technical and very uh, interesting uh, perspectives. So many things to fix in Lebanon. Uh, I think we need my far more time to go into more details. Unfortunately, the one hour time that we had being limited, I would like to thank you for making things so uh, quick. I would like to thank everybody who has joined us today. Um, I would like to, take the admin, to thank the admin team who has been able to make this webinar come through despite the glitches that happened. And I would like to just say, uh, stay tuned because we have more to come in the future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.